Praise the Lord. I'm reminded I came to your place here in Oshodi 25 years ago. And um, praise the Lord. I thought it was my first time of coming here. If I went there, I thought they'll say, if you are coming here for the first time, stand up. I was getting ready to stand up. And then your group pastor told me, I've been here 25 years ago. But the place was not like this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Look around. I think I should. Um, I think I should come back here for Sunday service. <laughs> Will that be all right? I said, "Will that be all right? You know, since uh, we started here so many years ago, I think I should have Monday, I should have Thursday, and I should have the Sunday. Praise the Lord. I'm just happy to be here with you. And uh, when our choir finished singing, you know, some people didn't know what to do, whether to clap or they say we should not clap. But thank you, choir, we're here for victory. Let's uh, pray to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus. We well, thank you for your beautiful people here. Lord, we're praying you'll beautify every life and every family in Jesus' name. And we pray that the study of your word will impact every life tonight. Do good in every life. The joy of the Lord is here already. And I pray, Lord, increase the joy of your people in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word. And through this place, we pray you bless multitudes all over the world in Jesus' name. The same victory we have here, the same joy we have here, and the same triumph we have here, the same faith we have here. Lord, put it in every heart that will hear the word of God today with us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We're coming to First John chapter 5. And as we look at First John chapter 5, we're looking at verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Verses 1 to 5. As we look at verse 1, it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. You would have noticed as you study First John that John the Beloved is a fond of talking about being born of God. That means being born again. That means being born anew, born from above, born by the Spirit of God. And then he wants to tell us, what is the consequence of being born again? What's the result of being born anew? That's why he says, and everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. I hope you understand that he says, will you love him that begat? That is, we're begotten of God. We're born again by the power of the Lord, by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, if we love him who has begotten us, then all the people that are begotten of him will love them too. Just saying that you love God, you love the Father, then you love the children of the Father. You love the King of the kingdom. You love the subjects of the kingdom. You love the people who are redeemed and born again just like you are. He tells us in verse 2, he says, by this we know. He says, if you're looking for the sign, I don't know I'm a child of God. How do you know you're a child of God? How do you know you belong to the family? He says, by this we know. He says, don't search here and there and don't look for other evidence just this by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we keep his commandments then he goes on to say in verse 3 for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous his commandments are not difficult. His commandments are not oppressive. His commandments will delight in those commandments because we love the Father, we love his rule, we love his principles, and we love all that he tells us and teaches us on how to live. We want to please him in verse 4. He says, and for whatsoever 
is born of God overcomes the world. There's another spirit that is walking in the world and is the spirit of the God of this age, the God of this world, and is contrary to God, is contrary to Christ, is contrary to the Holy Scriptures. And it says you cannot love two opposite entities. At the same time, if you love God, you are going to hate the devil. If you're on the side of God, you're going to turn away from Satan. That's why it says, and whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. There's a conflict, a conflict with the world, an opposition, opposition from the world. And because on the side of the Lord, that's why it says you overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Don't say you have faith if you are not living the overcoming life because faith overcomes. Faith is able to resist the devil and resist temptation and resist all the principles and practices of the world and be triumphant. It says, who is he that overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the son of of God. That's what we are looking at today and we're going to look at that in details tonight. I'm talking to you on our overcoming faith in Christ. Our overcoming faith in Christ. See, faith is the same whether in the first century or in the 24th century, the same thing. And because that faith came from the very heart of Christ and he parted unto us, imparted to the people that believe. And he says that faith at that time, those believers, they overcame the world, they overcame temptation, they overcame in their trials, and nothing was able to bring them down. He says in that same way, that same faith is in our heart, saved by the same Christ. We heard the same gospel and the same grace of the first century of Bible days. That same grace in our heart today. It says, you know, if you have that same faith, you are going to manifest that same victory. If you have that same Christ with you and he lives in you and he abides in you and he walks through you and he does everything he ought to do that he did in the lives of those early believers, it says the same result we're going to get because it says greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world and tonight if you have not tasted the victory victory is coming your way if you've got the victory in a moderate way you are going to get a larger victory a greater victory because it says by this faith your faith will increase tonight and the power of god in your life will increase in jesus name our overcoming faith in Christ. I'll make it personal, my overcoming faith. I said my overcoming faith. I have the faith that overcomes. Anywhere I go, anything that comes, any challenge that may come my way, I have the faith that overcomes. And it's not only to overcome in one day, one week, or one month. For every day of my life, I have the faith that overcomes. Are you there? I said every day of my life, I have the faith, the faith that overcomes. Don't look dejected. Don't look unfortunate. Don't look sorrowful. I have problems. I have challenges. And you know, they are greater than what I have. No, not at all. The faith you have will overcome in every battle of your life in Jesus name. Tonight you'll make a new discovery. You are more than a conqueror. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the privilege of the sons through Christ. The privilege of sons through Christ. It tells us here, it says we have a privilege and we have a favor and we have the mercy of God. And it tells us, I'll explain that to you later, the privilege of sons through Christ. Number two, the proof of salvation by Christ. If we have that salvation, and it comes in Christ, and it comes through Christ, it says there's a proof for that. There is a consequence for that. It says there's an evidence for that, the proof of salvation by Christ. And then number three, the power of saints in Christ. The power of saints in Christ. The privilege, the proof, the power. 
you'll have everything. We're coming to number one, the privilege of sons through Christ. Let's look at verse one. It says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now you see, that was it says, whosoever, whosoever believeth. Now the word believeth there is something practical. It's talking about a deep conviction in your heart. You believe that Jesus is the anointed one. He is the appointed one. That's what Christ there means the anointed one. is the one that the Father has anointed. is the one the Father has appointed. is the one that the Father has approved to be our Savior and to be our Lord. To die for us on the cross of Calvary. That's why John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world when you believe all that Christ is and that you believe is the appointed one there's no other name by which I can be saved he is the one the only one appointed and there is no other sacrifice by which I can be saved is the one that's approved of the heavenly father and there's no other lamb there's no other sacrifice that will get me saved and get me into the kingdom he is the one Jesus is the Christ it means Jesus is the anointed one, the approved one, and he is the one that has come to take our sins away. When you believe that with all your heart, and you're not thinking, I can save myself as if I'm a savior too. I can redeem myself. I'm a redeemer too. I can do whatever it is and get to the kingdom of God all by myself. It says, when you do not have confidence in your natural strength, when you do not have confidence in your own natural power, but you look to Christ and say, I believe from the death of my heart that he is the Christ. He is my savior. He is the one that the Bible has said he is unto me. It says that faith, that's what you call conviction. That faith, you bring that conviction into confession and you tell people around you, I cannot save myself. A religion cannot save me. Nobody else can save me. But Jesus is my savior. Jesus is the Christ. The Christ appointed to save me. He said such people are born of God. That means that that's the faith that makes you to be born again. You believe that he came to this world. He lived a sinless life. He lived a perfect life. And he died not for himself. He had no sin to die for. He died for you. And he was buried and he rose again on the third day and the bible says when you believe that with all your heart without any shadow of doubt that that is my savior it says you are born of god and let's look at john chapter one gospel according to john and we're reading here from chapter one and we're looking at verse 12 it says but as many as received him you see that as many as received to them, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. They believe on his name. They believe there's no other name by which I can be saved. There is no other name by which I can get to heaven. There's no other ladder that I can climb to heaven. Only the name of Jesus. They say, well, you believe that with all your heart. And I say, deep conviction within you that that's my Savior, that's my Lord. Even Satan cannot beat you out of that salvation. Your salvation will be firm and approved in Jesus name. Look at verse 29 the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and says behold the Lamb of God. That's what he's saying when you believe that. He says behold the Lamb of God. Look away from every other sacrifice. Look away from every other confidence. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of of the world and if he takes away the sin of the world he takes your sins away and when he takes them away there's no record on earth there's no record in heaven there's no record anywhere that you're still a sinner because all the sins are gone and they're in the depths of the god's forgetfulness in jesus name in john chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 3 john goes according to john we're looking at chapter 3 verse 3 it says jesus answered and said unto him verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born again 
Except a man be born again. Remember, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is the appointed one, is the anointed one, is the approved one to take my sins away, whosoever believeth that is born of God. And Jesus said he must be born again. And Nicodemus did not understand. How will I be born again? Nicodemus, the way to be born again, you believe that Jesus is the Savior. And not just the Savior of the world, Jesus is your Savior in particular. You believe that Jesus has been appointed of God to come and take you out of your sin and to take you to heaven. You believe that he's the only one, there's no other name. You believe that for you he died, and for you he was buried, and for you he rose again, and for you new life comes to you. The moment you believe that whosoever, remember that verse 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is is the Christ is born of God. It says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse 4 here. Nicodemus says unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? When you meet somebody on the road, when you meet somebody at the bus stop, when you meet somebody in the bus, when you meet somebody in the office, and you meet somebody anywhere, and he's asking the same question that Nicodemus is asking. How can a man be born again when he's old? How can a woman be born again when he's old? Then you remember, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is the appointed one. There's no other prophet, there's no other savior, there's no other redeemer. This is the only one that can save. You are able to tell them as they are asking the same question that Nicodemus is asking. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, do you know many people that uh, go to places of worship and they do not know that Jesus is the only one that can save them? Do you know many people go to places of worship and they think my good works, if my good works are greater than my bad works, if my generosity is greater than my stinginess, if my worship and service is greater than all the other things I do that are bad, if I can count all the Sundays in the year yeah, and I go in the majority of the Sundays, I go to church, minority, I don't go to church. I think I can have a past man. It doesn't work that way. Because whosoever, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Savior, he is the Redeemer, he is the one that purchases redemption for us, whosoever believes that, that's the one that will be saved. Look at verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And nothing can change the flesh except the new birth. Whosoever is born of the flesh were born of men and women. And that's born of the flesh. Until you come to Christ and you believe that Jesus is my Savior. And nothing can shake that away from your mind. Nothing can take that away from your conviction. Until that happens, the flesh is flesh. And the works of the flesh you will do. But it says in verse in verse 6, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. If it has not happened yet, it will happen. We're looking at first Peter, first Peter chapter 1. In first Peter chapter 1, verse 3. First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading here, verse 3. Blessed be the God. And the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy. You see that? There's not marriage. I paid money. I paid the pastor's deal. I paid this. I paid that. I helped the beggars. And I did this. And I did not know. Salvation doesn't come that way. Your sins are too deep for money to buy, for money to buy your forgiveness. It takes only the blood of Jesus. Only what Christ has done. That's why it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see what it says there? It says, by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he died for you, for your salvation, justification, and then he rose again. Look at verse 4. It says to him, 
in inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. It says when you are born again, you are born into an inheritance. Your name goes ahead of you to heaven. It writes your name in the book of life. After writing your name in the book of life, then it's expecting you as you move on and you're serving the Lord. Eventually you catch up with your name and you yourself you'll be in heaven in Jesus name who are kept by the power of God through faith. That's the word faith. Faith. Conviction that Christ is the only way. Conviction that Christ is the only savior and the trust in him. I trust him. I believe him. He saw that my soul is precious enough to come and die for me. And it says over here, you are cared by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And then it tells us in verse 18. Look at verse 18 here for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers it says but with the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot then it goes on to say in verse 22 seeing ye a purified and purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit Unto unfeigned, unpretending love of the brethren. See that she love one another with a pure heart. How? Fervently. It said, knows the consequence of conversion. First of all, it talks about conviction. I believe from the death of my heart that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is my Savior. And then comes my confession. From conviction, you cannot just hide that in your heart. I won't tell anybody. I won't allow people to know that's not conviction. When you have conviction, it comes out in confession. And you say, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is my Savior. Is the appointed one. Is the anointed one. And he has come to save me. And I put my trust in him. I put my faith in him. I put my confidence in him. And I am saved. Confession. And now comes the conversion. The conversion. Come back to First John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's the conversion right there. Conversion. It says, when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and it's the one that died for you. They appointed no other name by which you can be saved. And you affirm that. And you confess that confession. It says you are born of God. I'm coming to First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 verse 23. Being born again. You understand? Jesus used the terms born again. And uh, John the beloved used the term born of God. And here Peter is using the same term, terminology. He says, born again. There are some people that say, okay, born again, born again. Uh, that's peculiar to these, uh, you know, new, new churches. No, not at all. That's the Bible. That's the word of God. In fact, Jesus said, if you are not born again, all religion is worthless. If you are not born again, all religion is valueless. If you kind of, uh, you know, relegate being born again to the little children, okay, let them go, the scripture union, little, little boys and girls, born again, born again. No, not at all. There's no scripture union matter. This is Bible. This is the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Nicodemus. That was the confusion Nicodemus had because now I'm old and because I'm old and aged and religious, the ruler among the Jews, how can I be born again is that not for the little children it's for the adults too verse 23 being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth forever it liveth and abideth forever i pray that that conviction will be in your heart that conviction will be in your life it will come out as a confession to you and then it will affect your character, your conduct in Jesus' name. In First John chapter 2 verse 29. First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 29. It says in verse 29, If ye know that he is righteous, 
ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Born of him. Born of him. How do we know that? It's not coming to the consequence of conversion. Conviction. Confession. Conversion. Now the consequence. The consequence, the result is this. That if you're truly born again, you will resemble your father. Like father, like children. If you're truly born again, born of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit will be in your life. It says, if you know that he is righteous, and we know that, we know he's the righteous Christ. We know he's the righteous redeemer. We know he's the righteous Lord. In fact, it says, the Lord, our righteousness. And now it says, if we know that he is righteous, our savior, we know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And uh, John wants to explain that to us more in more details. Chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Oh, you don't understand that. It just means you don't practice sin. You don't make sin uh, the normal sin, the day-to-day -day sin, the regular sin, the habitual sin. It says, no, all those people that do that and they drink sin like they're drinking water and they eat up sin like uh, they're eating a food and they delight in sin and they put the garment of sin on and they rejoice in that. He said they've never met the Lord because when you meet the Lord, it takes away your sin, but then you come to know the Lord. You come to know the Lord and then you don't make a practice of sin anymore. You are not an habitual sinner anymore. When temptation is coming and you see that temptation is coming, you are not waiting and say, welcome. I welcome you. I've been waiting for you for a long time because for a long time I didn't do that bad thing. Now you have come welcome. No. If you are born again, you don't welcome temptation and sin. You say, no. Are the gone away from that. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me and the Lord is protecting me and I have a faith within me that will fight the good fight of faith and I will overcome. Somebody there, I will overcome. So the thing will not be, you know, putting your back to the wall every time temptation comes. You know, I'm helpless. You are no more helpless because the one that is in you is greater than the temptation coming from the world in Jesus' name. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he doesn't want to, because he is born of God. Look at verse 10. And in this, the children of God a manifest and the children of the devil whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God neither he that loveth not his brother uh, you know if you read uh, the gospel the, the epistle of uh, John this first epistle it's always talking about the love of the brethren why oh because anybody can say I'm born again I cannot tell I'm born again. I feel it in my soul I cannot get to your soul I feel it in my spirit i cannot get your spirit but i can see the action of love it says this one is tangible this one is practical this one is evident this one is verifiable if you find somebody it's always for a fight you can tell if you find somebody it's always getting angry you can tell if you have it sometimes so it's edgy and every time it's always like it's you know if he's not fighting the person on the right is fighting the person on the left if he's not fighting this is fighting that you can tell that he doesn't have the love of God is and that's why John says this is not theoretical this is practical see the joy of the Lord there and see the peace of God there and see long suffering there and see love there that's a practical thing that's why it's always saying he that loveth his brother that's a born again person he that does not you know count offense on you know people and then is holding them down tying them pay what you owe me you know all that kind of attitude look, look at verse 11 for this is the message that he heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Now he's talking about another person not as Cain who was of that wicked one. He says Cain was of the wicked one. 
John, how do you know? How can you mention somebody and say it was of the wicked one? He'll tell you why. It says, because he hated his brother and wherefore slew he, he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, ye know that we have passed from death to life because of what? I said, because of what? Because we love the brethren. It says uh, there's a path, there's a passage, there's a road. You know, the people who are into spiritual death, they're on this side. Life is on this side. And we know we belong to God because we are passed from death unto life. We love the brethren. The opposite is true. Somebody is on this side. He has uh, the love of God. And he has life because he passed from death unto life. But, you know, something happens. And that thing that happened made him to say, uh-huh, that fellow has committed the unpardonable sin. The unforgivable sin. And this unforgivable sin that he's talking about is not even in the Bible. It's a local law. It's a personal law. It's a traditional law. It's a cultural law. It's a, some, a sectional law. And be, we're, we're following the Bible. We believe the word of God. And we're passed from death unto life. And this uh, fellow, he comes out of us. And then he's looking at a cultural law, a personal law, a personal thing that he made up. And somebody offended him in that personal thing. And he counts that as an unpardonable sin, unforgivable sin. He has hatred in his heart. You know what? He passes from life unto death. Look at this. I'm looking at it in First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. And we're looking at it from verse, uh, from verse 14. We know that we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother. He that loveth not. So tell me the rest there. Abideth in death. He's gone from the way, from the side of life, and is gone to death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Is passed from life unto death. He enjoys sinning. He enjoys hatred. He enjoys bitterness. He enjoys cruelty. He enjoys oppression. is passed from life and is passed unto death because of a minor thing that took place and is holding on to that. And because of that, now there's hatred and there's bitterness and there's no love and he passes from life unto death. We are passed to life and I remain on the side of life. Somebody there said, I remain on the side of life. Oh, we're looking at uh, First John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 4. First John chapter 4 verse 4. Ye of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is that one in the world? Well, the principal one, his name is Satan. And then all the people that are working for Satan, all the people that are helping Satan to do his work, his work of destroying good things, his work of uh, hindering the people that are on their way to heaven. But he says, we are of God and we have overcome them. That trials coming from them, we overcome. Temptations coming from them, we overcome. And all the animosities and hatred coming from them, we overcome. How and why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's no temptation that will come upon you that you don't have grace to overcome. If God allows any temptation, if God allows any trial, it's because he will give you the grace to overcome. I said you have the grace to overcome. And you will overcome in Jesus' name. We're coming back. We're coming back to First John chapter 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Listen to this now. And everyone that loveth him that begat, him 
that begat. Who is that? That's God. The one that gave birth to us to enter into the kingdom. Everyone that loveth him that begat. Everyone that loveth God. Everyone that loveth the Father. Everyone that loveth the Savior. Everyone that loveth the Redeemer. Everyone that loveth him that begat. Loveth him also that is begotten. Who are those? Those are Christians. Those are born again people. They are begotten. You see, I love the God who makes us to be born again. Then you are going to love those who are born again, those who are begotten of him. Uh, because that's the evidence will really belong unto the Lord. We're looking at uh, first uh, Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. There's a consequence when we say we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and the consequences this that your life will be different and your life will change and that transformation will be readily seen and visible first peter we're looking at chapter 2 verse 1 wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings you see that if you're born again you see that this one will not follow me to the kingdom because it will hinder you it will pull you back it will be like strings or ropes or cords tied around your ways and those things will pull you back into darkness and into the world therefore it says to lay everything aside and as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world that she may grow thereby as newborn babes let's say desire within you a liking a longing within you that you want this milk of the word of god if so be that she have tasted that the lord is gracious look at verse 9 but she are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light you'll show forth the praises of god in jesus name we come to point number two now the proof of salvation by Christ, salvation by Christ. The people that have the thing, they have salvation, and it says salvation by their personal effort, salvation by trying the best I can, salvation by turning over a new leaf. Nobody ever, nobody ever turned over a new leaf to receive salvation. You know, there are people that think, if I'm just with them, just with them, I come to our church here, and I sing the songs of them, and I listen to the Bible studies. You know, it takes more than that. What you hear, you must work on. I don't think you've heard as many sermons as Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot heard all the sermons Jesus gave. Look at Judas Iscariot sitting down there, and then Jesus is talking Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. He listened to everything. And then when all the other people went back home, Judas continued. But you see, that didn't give him the staying power. The one that has salvation, and the salvation is full and free and final and complete because he loved 30 pieces of silver more than jesus christ the love of money if that is still there and a change has not taken place how would you say then that you're a real child of god you are born again that's why it's telling us now what's the proof of salvation in christ how can you tell without a shadow of doubt that i have this salvation and the salvation i got here from christ the proof look at first john chapter five first john chapter five is saying us now about the proof in verse two it says by this we know it says don't look for any other evidence any other proof and don't look for any other mark or characteristic it says by this we know that we love the children of god when we love god and keep his commandments that is very simple you know john john the beloved always puts it very simple and very clear it says by this we know by this we know it says somebody is giving a testimony high sounding testimony and a great great testimony a job breaking testimony and when they give testimony you look at them like you say wow somebody is giving us it's almost like it's another paul on the way to damascus it says don't judge yet don't conclude yet look at his life 
Is he obeying the commandments of the Lord? All that testimony will go down the drain if there is no accompanying obedience to the word of the Lord. Because he says, it's not by your talk, it's not by your publicity, it's not by your proclamation. It says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Uh, come to uh, the word of God and see John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, see what Jesus Christ himself said as the evidence and the proof of the people that really love the Lord. The people that have given themselves to the Lord and then we can say by this we know. By this we know. You know sometimes uh, we use the words uh, you know carelessly. We say brother so and so. How do you know his brother so and so? Sister so and so. How do you know she is sister so and so? We must look at our lives and we must find out where is the evidence? Where is the mark? And where is the proof? Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Simple. You love me, show it by the attitude you have, by the actions of your life, by the activities of your life, that you keep my commandments. Look at verse 21. He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he that has my commandments and keepeth them, that's obedience, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him, I will manifest myself unto him. He's telling us that the evidence of uh, salvation and the proof of that salvation, Christ abides in me, show it by the life you live. I love Christ, show it by the way you live. I'm a child of God, show it by the way you live. Look at verse 24. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sins. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sins. He has given us his word. He gives us his commandments. And Jesus said, you're looking for the mark of these people that are making loud professions. We belong to Christ. We belong to the Lord. Look at the life they live. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my words, my sins, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. He said this was not his private word, his private commandment. It was a commandment of the Lord. Look at chapter 15. Chapter 15 of John, and I'm reading from verse 10. Chapter 15 of John, verse 10. It says... If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. You see, that's always the, uh, the proof. That's always the test. That if ye keep my commandments, then ye shall abide in my love. Even as I, even as I kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. And you see, it says uh, you, you measure your obedience to the commandments of the Lord by the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love him. Because he gave his life for me. And because of that, I'm going to keep his commandments. And there's no challenge. You know, there sometimes there are people that say, well, you know, I was keeping the commandments of God, of Christ, because I love Jesus Christ until brother so-and-so offended me. And when brother so-and-so offended me, then I, just, I pinched myself and I woke up and I said, why am I doing this? Why am I doing right? Why am I righteous? Why am I obedient? Why am I loving? Why am I obeying the commandments of God? Look at brother so-and-so, a member of our church, and look at what he has done. Uh -huh. Because uh, brother so-and-so backslid, you are going to backslide. Because brother so-and-so offended you, offended the Lord, you are going to retaliate on Christ your Savior. You are going to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I cannot obey you anymore. I cannot follow you anymore because look at this man. That man is strong enough to pull you away from the evidence of salvation. Pull you away from the consequence of Calvary because Jesus died for you. I heard of uh, you know one uh, woman. Uh, that woman is not here. The women who are here, you are not like this. Give me a good amen. 
you know, the husband went to mess up himself. And because the husband messed up himself and said, look at this man. This is a man that preached to me. This is a man that brought me to the church. This is a man that you always say, you know, follow your Bible and read the Bible and see his life. See what he has done. Okay. If you can do that. I didn't want to do this before. In fact, I'm going to even, I'm going to do whatever it is so that I will also punish you. Uh -huh. She wants to go to hell because the husband wants to go to hell. I will not go to hell for anybody. I said I will not go to hell for anybody. You know, because uh, that man messed up, all right, I'm going to go and mess, and I will, I will teach him a lesson. Uh, you see, when I go to hell, I will teach him a lesson and tell him that you are the one that took me to hell. You want to teach somebody a lesson? It's like, you know, do you see those cars uh, passing by there up and down? Somebody was uh, careless and then jumped into the road and broke his leg. Ah. Uh, are you careless like that and you broke your leg? I'll teach you a lesson. I will not only break my leg, I'm going to allow the vehicle to crush me, to teach you a lesson. After you are gone, we'll keep on eating and drinking and enjoying ourselves. The lesson you taught us, you will not learn from the lesson yourself. How do you go to hell for somebody? To retaliate on somebody, you want to go to hell. You know, somebody said, you know, I was a worker and then I was zealous and all that until, look at that other person there. He did something, okay, for you, because of you. I'm going to forsake the work of God so that I will teach you a lesson. Well, if you forsake the work of God, you lose your crown because of him. You lose your reward because of him. I'm not going to lose my reward for anybody. Am I talking to somebody there today? You will stand. Somebody there said you will stand. You know, sometimes, I don't know why people do this, please. Do you permit me to tell you the truth? I said, do you permit me? You know, as I listen to the chorus singing, uh, you know, today, I said, even if it's for chorus singing again, I can come back to this church. Because, you know, it's sad. You know, another one came, another one came, another one. I was looking at his mouth. I said, I know this brother. So he can sing like this. You know, when you, when you do something that other people say, because of what that person is doing, I think I want to come back here. You know, all the people, I don't know whether this is how you do it every time, but I hope you do like this every time. I said, I hope you do like this every time. You know, everything I see, the choir coming, I see every, I see something. It makes us, the rest of us want to serve the Lord. As you see somebody, is encouraging us. But if another person comes there and then he gives us a pelago, he gives us something that is not all right. I will not say, well, I will not come to Oshode because of them, because I will come again. Yeah. I said, I will come. Yeah. But thank God you are an encourage, encourage other people. Make them to want to serve the Lord. That you say, because of him and because of her, I will serve the Lord. But if there's anybody that she you know says, I'm going to go astray. Don't say, okay, I will not serve the Lord. Like father, like children, I'm going to keep on serving the Lord. And you will keep on serving the Lord. We will keep on serving the Lord in Jesus' name. Because it says over there, if you love the Lord, you will keep the commandments of the Lord. I'm going to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And see what the Lord is teaching us here. Psalm 119. And I'm reading from verse 16. Psalm 119, verse 16. It's telling us the attitude we ought to have. It's saying in verse 16, I made haste. I delayed not to to keep thy commandments. I made it. I delayed not to keep thy commandments. Whatever people do, whatever challenges you may have, whatever disappointments some other people may give you, you say, I will serve the Lord. Somebody there, I will serve the Lord. Look at verse 127, Psalm 1, uh, 119, verse 127. It says, therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, about fine gold. Therefore, I 
I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. That's the attitude the Lord wants us to have. Because we're children of God, and because we're saying, he loved me, he gave himself for me, he died for me, and because of the sacrifice, what he has done for me, I'm going to keep on serving the Lord. We're looking at First John again. Come back to First John. We're looking at him from chapter 2. First John chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 3. First John chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. See how the Bible says it over and over and over. Hereby we know that we love him. Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Look at verse 4. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby know we that we are in him. Verse 6, he that says he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. If we say we know him, if we say we love him, we ought to walk even as he walked. Chapter 3 verse 24, First John chapter 3 and in verse 24 it says in verse 24 and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him you see that he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and let's continue with this chapter 5 chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 3 chapter 5 verse 3 it says for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous his commandments are not oppressive his commandments are not difficult his commandments do not hurt us the commandments will delight in them it's our joy to have those commandments of the lord see the attitude of other people psalm 19 psalm 19 1 9 psalm 19 i'm reading from verse 8 and you see the commandments of the lord and then you see the result you see the consequence you see the people that really know the lord what their attitude is to that commandment it says the statutes of the lord are right rejoice in the heart the commandment of the lord is pure enlightening the eyes look at verse 10 more to be desired than gold more to be desired than gold the much fine gold sweeter also than honey and uh, the honeycomb that means i love them i rejoice in them. i delight in them. i want them because the commandments of the lord they are not grievous but they are pleasant and they are delightful we're looking at uh, job chapter 23 job chapter 23 verse 12 neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips? I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. It says, think about the food, about the meal you enjoy the most, the kind of food you enjoy the most. And then when you want to eat that food, it's like, you know, it's one of the happiest times of your life. Then it says, Job said, if you can imagine what you feel when you are going to take your sweetest, your, your most wonderful meal, it says, I assume the word of his mouth more than my necessary food. That means I count those commandments as pleasant, delightsome, delightful, and I enjoy them. And that's the attitude of a real child of God. Jeremiah chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 15, and we're reading here from verse 16. 15, 16, the words, thy words were found, and I did eat them. 
like food. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And this is not a person you're forced to read the Bible. This is not a person you're forced to come to the Bible study. This is not a person you're forced to learn from the word of God. He said, that's my delight. That's my joy. It's the highest point of my life when I'm able to sit down and read my Bible and read the word of God. It says in that verse 16, thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy words was and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. That's the attitude we ought to have, and that's the attitude that God appreciates that we love the word of God. And th those words, they are pleasant, and those words are wonderful. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Revelation chapter 14, and we're reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. That word patience there means perseverance. Here is the perseverance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. The last chapter of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22, reading from verse 12. Revelation 22 verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Look at this. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed are they, not the people that just know it in their head, know it in their mind, and they, they have, you know, maybe Bibles, and therefore they know it, they'll be learning, but they never do. It says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter, may enter in through the gates into the city. I pray you'll be one of them in Jesus' name. We're coming to First John now, chapter 5. And we're coming to the final point, and this is point number 3, which is the power of saints in Christ. The power of saints in Christ. Christ. It tells us in First John chapter 5, reading from verse 4, and whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Who is he that overcometh, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. The power of saints that makes us to overcome. Look at First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 has been talking about other people too. The young men and the fathers in Christ and the people who have given themselves to the Lord and who have the grace of God in their lives and they are overcomers. It says in First John chapter 2 verse 13, I write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. Young men, ye have overcome the wicked, the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Verse 14, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I, I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. Ye are strong. The grace of God will make you strong. Your faith in Christ will make you strong. Strong people don't try to avoid difficulty. If you are strong, when difficulties come, say, wonderful. This will help me prove how strong I am. That's how it is in the physical. That's how it is in the spiritual. Strong people do not go to a particular corner and will say, what's happening to you? Why are you there? There's temptation in the world, so I can't come out. You are not working. I, I tried to go to a place of work, but you know, when I got to that place of work, the temptations there are too many. I don't want to lose my salvation. What kind of salvation have you got? 
Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you are born again and Christ lives on the inside of you, go out there and go and win the victory. And you'll be victorious in Jesus' name. Your boy came back from school. And then as he came back from school, you say, are you on vacation? No, daddy. Uh, what's happening to you? You know, I've got the salvation. And the salvation is so delicate. And as I go to school, I was surprised. I was surprised. The way the other children, the other students, the way they were living. And the things they were doing. And I remember that this salvation is so important. That, uh, you know, when I'm in the class, uh, you know, the lecturer is saying this and that. When I'm here, somebody, something is happening. So I said I should run back home and just stay inside here in our house. So that I will not, uh, I will not fall and lose my salvation. The salvation. The kind of salvation that cannot stand there. And while those other people are talking their rubbish, you stand up and say, Hey, listen to me, everybody. I want to tell you something. A story you have never heard. A story that will change your life. I knew somebody. And that somebody that I knew, you know, I used to be afraid. I used to do this and that when I met him, something happened to me and my life turned around completely. And the whole ears, they are watching, they want to listen to you. And then you say, it's Jesus Christ. I repented of my sin. I became born again. Now I'm a child of God. Ah, they say, pastor, pastor. I say, yes, that's my title. I'm pastor in this class. You know, they will not bother you with those temptations anymore. But the one that says, I have to Temptation, I have temptation and it's running away from everywhere and everyone. Uh -uh. Check up that salvation. Come out now because greater is seed that is in you. Somebody there said, Greater is seed that is in you than he that is in the world. And the Lord will give you the victory in Jesus' name. Daniel didn't run back home from Babylon, but he made up his mind and he said, I will not do that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not run back home because of idol worship. They said, we will not worship your idol. Peter and John did not cow, did not bow down or bend. They said, Whatever you want to do, we want to announce to you that we have had the word of God and we are going to obey the word of God. Whether it is right to obey you more than God, you judge, you judge. But we are going to obey the word of the Lord. And you will obey the word of the Lord in Jesus. Do you remember Paul the apostle? He was preaching to that deputy and this other occultic man was trying to do some occultic sin. And Paul, the Paul said, ah, that power sir here. Challenges are here. Difficulties are here. We better be careful now. But Paul looked at him eyeball to eyeball. He didn't bend down and say, if this man will destroy me, nobody will destroy you. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment you will condemn. And so he looked at him and said, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of righteousness. Will you not stop to disturb and to hinder the way of the Lord? And then he pronounced, because you know, we are the people in authority. We have the final say. He said, you'll be blind for a season. And then they packed them aside. And then they went on preaching. And that man came to the Lord. That same power is coming upon your life. Yeah. You will not run away from any enemy of righteousness. You will stand in Jesus' name. That's why it says we overcome the world. And thank God tonight you came to learn how to overcome. And after the Bible study tonight, power is inside you. Authority is inside your life. And you will overcome in Jesus' name. In fact, you know, the Lord said, look at what he said in John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And I'm reading here from verse 33. John chapter 16 verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. What follows that? I have overcome the world. And because you overcame, you will overcome. The world will not overcome you. 
the trials will not overcome you the temptations will not overcome you you will be on the victory side what overcomes what gives us the victory galatians chapter 2 galatians chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 20 galatians chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 20 it says i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live i I'm crucified with Christ. What does that mean? It says my unclean nature is crucified with Christ. My weak nature is crucified with Christ. It says I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. There's a new personality now, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. Of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Have you noticed something here? That Paul, most of the time, he'll talk about us. Christ died for us. He'll talk about us. He rose again for us. He'll talk about us. He's going to prepare a place for us. But now it becomes personal. It becomes personal. Look at this verse 20. Uh, you read after me. When I read a part, you mention it and then you read it with conviction. Are you ready? Yes. I am crucified with Christ. Crucified. Nevertheless, I live. Nevertheless, I Yet not I. Yes. But Christ liveth in me. Christ and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then that's the confidence Paul had. That's the confidence you have. Because now you live by the faith of the Son of God. And the faith of the Son of God is an overcoming faith. It's a conquering faith. That's why you are going out of the Bible study tonight a conqueror. You are a victor tonight. The power of God will follow you. All the things that threatened you before, now you are the overcomer. Uh, let me give you this pill, this gospel pill, gospel pill before you go. We're looking at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 37. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors. Through him that loved us there's somebody who loves you more than you can tell his name is jesus he died for you he shared his blood for you he said this one i'll take this one to heaven he will fight satan tooth and nail to make sure that satan doesn't have the victory over you because he says, I died for him. I died for her. I'm preparing a place for her in heaven. I'm preparing a place for him in heaven. And nothing, nobody will snatch this one out of my hand. It will knock the head of the devil away on your behalf. And he says, because of that, now in all these things, in all the challenges you may face, now I am more than a conqueror. Somebody there. I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. His love is everlasting. He loves you. His love goes beyond your weakness, goes beyond your challenges, and his grace is sufficient for you. By the faith of the Son of God, you are an overcomer. Yeah. Go into the world and show the victory and the triumph of Christ living big from inside you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That faith is inside there and that love is there. The Lord loves you. He will not allow you to fall. No, you will not fall. No, you will not fail. When those temptations come, you make up your mind. I will overcome. You are an overcomer already. Pray, pray. Tell the Lord, O oh Lord, I overcome. O oh Lord, I overcome. Challenges, temptations, trials, I overcome. Because he loved me and he gave himself for me.